When Sega of America prepared to launch the Mega Drive as the genesis in the US, one of their strategies was to develop a line of games which would cater to the Western market. Nintendo's mascots were already household names across the world. To counter this, Sega set out to obtain a number of licenses and benefit from their popularity and appeal. As a licensee, Sega would have to present a detailed proposal to win over the licensor's trust and convince them that their brand was in good hands. One of the key interest points was the worldwide sales forecast of a game. A licensor typically demanded part of their royalties to be paid as minimum guarantee, regardless of actual sales achieved. The marketing team in Japan, Europe, and America would work closely together to present an accurate sales forecast and subsequently work out what to offer. By 1989, Sega had successfully tied a number of celebrities to their lineup of sports games. Licenses for Moonwalker, Ghostbusters, Dick Tracy, Rambo, and Spider-Man were also in Sega's pocket. But when it came to finding a character to rival Super Mario, Sega set their eyes on none other than Disney's own mascot. For huge companies like Disney, licensing was a key part of their business. Getting their IPs on a wide range of products not only meant extra cash flow, but extra exposure too. The biggest risk was attaching their name to low-quality products that could potentially tarnish a beloved brand. Disney's Consumer Products Licensing Group would take a look at Sega's proposal and negotiate a deal. By the end of 1989, they reached an agreement, and a few months later, Sega could proudly announce that two Mickey games were planned a game based on the movie Fantasia, and an original game involving Mickey and Minnie that would soon start production as Castle of Illusion. Sega of America appointed Jim Huther as producer for this new Mickey game. He would supervise this important project and keep all involved parties in line. The actual development of Castle of Illusion was in the hands of a young team at Sega of Japan under the direction of Emiko Yamamoto. When she was handed the Mickey Mouse project, she took it in an interesting direction. Instead of making a cutesy contemporary title, she took inspiration from the rich and imaginative world of classic Disney movies. She thought it should be true to what she felt was the essence of Disney, a positive world of dreams and imagination. Disney's first full-length animated feature, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, was a key inspiration and pillar for the project. It would spark Mickey's nemesis, the evil witch Ms. Rebel, and several key locations of the game. Disney was very protective over its intellectual properties, especially their company mascot, Mickey Mouse. An elaborate licensing guide provided visual reference and guidelines. A producer from Disney's new software group would be appointed to review Sega's deliveries and give their comments. During the planning stage, a meeting was held to discuss how Mickey could defeat his adversaries in the game. Stomping, kicking, or direct blows were out of the question, and they ultimately settled on a bounce attack. Another strict rule was that Mickey was not allowed to die, even in a video game. To work around this issue, lives were simply renamed Tries. Castle of Illusion was Emiko Yamamoto's first video game project. This gave her a fresh perspective. Her lack of experience meant that she would suggest ideas that perhaps a more seasoned game designer would quickly discard as being too time-consuming or too difficult to realize. The result was a number of big or unconventional set pieces that really added charm to the game. Sega's producer opted to tone down the difficulty level compared to most other games in the early Mega Drive library to make it more accessible to a broad audience. The pixel artists involved studied Mickey's movements and set out to capture his cheerful, curious personality in this 16-bit rendition. One of their goals was to have a fluid, expressive animation and keep Mickey in motion, even without the player's input, which ended up being a sizable challenge for the programming team. All background art and sprites that were used to display the game screen had to fit inside a tiny bit of video memory inside the console. Storing all of Mickey's animation frames inside the VRAM would be very taxing. The programmers implemented a new routine that would stream Mickey's sprites from the game cartridge in real time, keeping the footprint inside the VRAM to a bare minimum, and leaving plenty of room for detailed backgrounds. The challenge, however, was keeping an acceptable frame rate, as this technique required more CPU cycles and data transfers than usual. To fill Mickey's new world with interesting characters, several other Disney projects were referenced. For the milk bottle scene, it was decided to use Elliot from the 1977 movie Pete's Dragon as a level boss, but they struggled to tie him in with the level theme. Producer Jim Huther sent over a bunch of candy as inspiration. Art director Takashi Yuda liked the red licorice in particular, and thought it would perfectly fit as the dragon's body. 
The art team spent more time than usual to capture that rich, painted feel of the Disney classics with their pixel art. The milk level featured an extra layer of parallax scrolling thanks to some clever trickery. Each of the two background planes were split in two and got their own scrolling speed and render priority. One of the limitations of this trick was that layers on the same background plane could not overlap. To work around this, they used sprites on top of the cakes and scrolled them at the same speed as that particular background plane. The result was a spectacular showcase of the Mega Drive hardware in the early days of the console. To bring Mickey's dream world to life, the team contracted the perfect man for the job, Shigenori Kamiya. He was responsible for a dreamy soundtrack to the Japanese super mystery magazine Moo in the early 80s. Kamiya can be considered a true pioneer of synthesizer music in Japan. His synth sounds were a breath of fresh air in the world of Japanese TV commercials in the 80s. Inside Sega, a completely different team was working on an 8-bit version of the game led by Yoshio Yoshida. Both development teams shared their ideas, but decided to go their own direction and play to the hardware's strengths. The 8-bit team put a tremendous amount of effort into coming up with varied and interesting set pieces for Mickey to ensure a stellar experience. The main team members would be responsible for some of the best titles for the Master System. During the final stages of production, the 16-bit team went the extra mile to make sure the game would be a feast for the eyes. Various backgrounds were greatly improved. For example, the storm stage got its beautiful dramatic cloudscape. One of the final touches was to completely redo the castle hall visuals to make it look a bit more sinister. A couple months later, both producers at Sega and Disney signed off the final game code with great anticipation, as they knew they had something special in their hands. For the design of the packaging and sales materials, Sega once again worked closely with Disney to ensure that their beloved mouse was handled with care. Castle of Illusion hit store shelves in November 1990. Retailers had ordered their copies with confidence. They were attracted to the familiarity of the character, which they believed would make it an easy sell to consumers. Their faith was well placed, as the game remained at the top of the charts for well over a year. All the hundreds of thousands of consumers would not be disappointed. Castle of Illusion was the standout platformer in the early Mega Drive library before the days of Sonic, and set the bar high. It showcased what 16-bit hardware could bring to the platforming genre in terms of animation, graphics, sound, and overall atmosphere. With this success, the team in Japan would quickly begin work on a spiritual sequel. Over in the US, Sega was starting their long-planned Fantasia project. Sega of America was mostly reliant on Western studios for the actual game development of their own titles. For Fantasia, they reached out to the French studio Infogrames. They had a long list of home computer games under their belt, and were even experienced in building games around licensed characters. The movie Fantasia had just celebrated its 50th anniversary in 1990 with a theatrical re-release. This groundbreaking animated masterpiece originally started as a Mickey short, with an abundance of production value animated to The Sorcerer's Apprentice. The project quickly grew into a full concert feature with seven shorts, all animated to classical music. It showcased the absolute best in animation and craftsmanship. Fantasia was Walt Disney's most ambitious project, and it was very near and dear to his heart, but it unfortunately didn't receive the audience it deserved during his lifetime. Adapting this animation masterpiece to Mega Drive hardware was a challenge in and of itself. The French team took the animated short The Sorcerer's Apprentice as a starting point. Mickey would traverse through Yen Sid's castle in his iconic red garb and battling the walking brooms. All other segments would be mixed and mashed together into other levels for the game. When the game was demoed at the summer CES of 91, it managed to impress most gaming press thanks to its solid visuals and the brand's strong reputation. The gameplay, however, still needed a ton of tweaking. The controls felt very stiff and unresponsive. Infogrames had pushed the gameplay implementation to the final stage of production. Unfortunately, time quickly ran out and they didn't have the opportunity to improve the gameplay. Fantasia had a strict release date. The game was considered to be one of the best sellers for the holiday season. On top of that, it was of the utmost importance to have it in stores alongside the Fantasia VHS release. This was a huge event considering the movie would be released to the public for the very first time. This led to a very rushed tail end of development, resulting in a visually appealing game with practically unfinished gameplay. Despite the lukewarm reviews, Fantasia still sold exceptionally well the first month, but this would not last for long. Walt Disney made strict rules that his passion project Fantasia would never be licensed. 
This apparently wasn't known company-wide. When his cousin Roy Disney took notice of the game's release, he requested to pull it from stores. Sega was compensated for any lost sales, and was rewarded with favorable conditions for upcoming licenses. In Japan, development had progressed much more smoothly. The original Castle of Illusion team had been working on a spiritual follow-up to their successful game, Quackshot, starring Donald Duck. Emiko Yamamoto kept true to the spirit of Donald's world we've come to know and love from the comic book series. Carl Barks was one of the key figures who helped to shape Duckburg, and introduced many new characters from Scrooge McDuck to Gyro Gearloose. Between the 40s and 60s, he wrote many captivating stories around these characters which often had a sense of adventure and treasure hunting. The Scrooge and Donald comic books would continue to be successful in many countries for decades to come. Filmmakers like George Lucas and Steven Spielberg would even pay homage to Carl Barks' legacy with the boulder scene in Indiana Jones. By the late 80s, the adventurous spirit of the comics led to the highly successful DuckTales cartoon series and video game. The team at Sega had no shortage of inspiration. They would make sure that their game would breathe that same sense of adventure. Quackshot would take Donald across the globe, searching for the secret treasure of King Garuzia. Armed with his plunger gun, he would travel from Transylvania to the South Pole and keep ahead of Big Bad Pete. This side-scrolling adventure demanded some backtracking and mild puzzle-solving from the player. For example, each location required a specific item or weapon to overcome an obstacle in the level. Elements like these contributed to the adventurous spirit of Quackshot. Takashi Yuda and his art team captured the world beautifully, which resulted in one of the most aesthetically impressive games on the platform at that time, helped in part by a stellar soundtrack once again composed by Kamiya Studio. A track from his Moo soundtrack, called UFO Dance, proved to be a great starting point for the Duckburg level theme. Disney would make sure that the character's personality shine through. Donald's foot-tapping idle animation and the temper bar successfully portrayed his short-fused character in the game. The additional decision to arm Donald with a gun that shoots plungers, bubblegum, or popcorn spared the team some headaches down the line. For the 8-bit platforms, a Donald Duck game called the Lucky Dime Caper was in production. The Disney producer had already signed off the use of a hammer as a subweapon. In the early stages, it seemed harmless, but when Donald was bludgeoning seals in the second part of the game, they realized something had to be changed. After some debate, the seals were replaced with snow monsters. In Quackshot, penguins could remain in the South Pole level, thanks to Donald's more pacifistic ways of attack. Production for Quackshot was wrapped up roughly a year after Castle of Illusion. Greg Ray, an illustrator with a track record in Disney-themed artwork, created the box art. He came fresh from drawing the US cover for the original Sonic the Hedgehog game, which helped him get acquainted with Sega. The game was readily available at the start of 1992. Sega wasn't able to capitalize on the holiday season, but the game was a strong seller nonetheless. Along with Streets of Rage, it would help the company financially jumpstart the new year. The success and quality of Castle of Illusion and Quackshot satisfied Disney. Sega was therefore given favorable conditions when it came to obtaining new licenses. They opted for Tailspin and The Little Mermaid. Both games turned out decent and were developed by studios with close connections to Sega of America. Alakazam! The winning team in Japan, led by Emiko Yamamoto, stayed together for a third and final installment on the Mega Drive, World of Illusion this time starring both Mickey and Donald in their quest to return home after being trapped in a magical world. The classic Disney movies would again be inspirational, similarly to Castle of Illusion. From Pinocchio to Alice in Wonderland to The Sword and the Stone, implementing characters from these movies was fairly straightforward as they weren't new properties and Disney had full ownership of them. To deviate from the two previous games, the team added two-player co-op, Specially designed substages would take full advantage of this mechanic, requiring the players to work together to reach the end of the level. For example, a parent or older sibling could guide a young player through the magical worlds. This would be in line with the family-friendly vision of the series. In one-player mode, Mickey would act as an easy introductory level, while playing through Donald's campaign added an additional learning curve to the game. Just as they did previously, Sega of America and Disney were there to provide their input. Beta versions were often transferred via modem, which could take all night. Balancing the violence in the Disney games was always a struggle for Disney producers and game developers alike. Platform games were typically built around action, so even mild cartoon violence was often unavoidable. 
In World of Illusion, Nikki and Donald were given magic capes as a means of attack, which would transform the enemies into less harmful creatures. This was a great solution of having action without any needless brutality. Two newcomers to Sega's internal sound team were put on the project to compose a fitting soundtrack, one of them being Tomoko Sasaki, the main composer on Y Star and Nights into Dreams. World of Illusion was released in September of 1992, a few weeks after Sonic Tuesday, and was once again a critical and commercial success. Like before, owners of Sega's 8-bit machines were not left out. They could guide Mickey through the adventures of Land of Illusion. The Illusion games had become an important pillar in Sega's own library, offering a line of family-friendly titles. After having delivered three successful titles back-to-back, -back, the Mega Drive team split ways. Art director Takashi Yuda was transferred over to America to work on Sonic 3. Game designer Emiko Yamamoto would retire from developing Disney games for Sega, but would stay involved in the Disney brand, ultimately working on the Kingdom Hearts series as executive producer for Disney. For the 8-bit platforms, two games would still hit the market, developed by a largely different team aided by the external studio aspect. The success and strength of the Illusion series was the result of the great respect paid to the license by the team at Sega. Instead of slapping the characters onto their own game concept, they really understood the feel of the brands and the company. Disney and Sega of America gave them guidance, but also allowed for enough creative freedom to let them explore ideas and Disney worlds beyond Mickey and Donald's own universe. This last point in particular made these games so unique. The player wouldn't just relive a movie in video game form, but explore new worlds and stories with these beloved characters. Thank you.